Right, morning, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into, into contracts this morning after our, our discussions yesterday. I think some, some really interesting things came out. And uh, as we were just waiting for the session to kick off this morning, I was saying, saying to Trevor, we've got an agreement that we need to put in place and maybe we must get Ed to translate it into French for us so we can make sure there's no ambiguity in the, in, in the document because uh, that, that is uh, definitely concern that I think uh, many people have with with contracts and, and the wording you know do is it clear do you understand it what does it really mean can it be interpreted in different ways and and what are the what are those potential uh, potential effects um, and uh, you know how does how does that uh, make you feel about having contracts and who puts contracts together for you so I think we're going to pick up from from that point Trevor was uh, on full steam when we, we had to cut the session off yesterday, otherwise we probably would have run the whole morning. So uh, I think I'm going to hand back over to Trevor to pick up where he left off and see if he can disturb Trevor Cardi's breakfast and uh, turn his milk sour in his in his muesli there or whatever he's got in front of him. So Trevor Mel, over to you. Yeah, thank you. There were just so many different directions that we could have gone there. And I was just thinking overnight, you know, do do people understand the absolute minimum downside, I'm not talking maximum, I'm talking minimum downside of entering into a contract. And, and that is um, that it's there uh, for when things go pear-shaped pear -shaped, and um, that your minimum is, I was just watching yesterday uh, while I was working, I was watching the TV, there were a couple of court cases on, and I mean, I, I talked about litigious, and I think I spelt it incorrectly there. So, Ed, you might have to just bring up the UK or French spelling of litigious for us. Um, but just to go to court, uh, when I was looking at these numbers about three, four years ago, you're working with an advocate or two, the minimum cost of an ad advocate for a day and a decent advocate, uh, no, decent advocate. Okay, so um, all ad advocates would say that they are decent, but I'm saying not the top of the range, 50,000 rand. Um, and then if you want really good ones that we actually see uh, on our TV screens, et cetera, here on these high profile cases, man, you're looking at way over a hundred grand a day. Um, and then uh, your, uh, it, you've got all the attorneys behind it and whoever went to court, the downside is that um, if you're arguing the toss and for some reason you happen to lose, you carry their costs and the costs of their advocates and everything as well. So I'd, I'd put it to you, just by entering into a, an agreement, you're probably looking at anywhere uh, between 300,000 to half a million, if not more, in today's terms, to actually go and fight that out in court. So uh, it's, a, it's a big commitment just to get into an agreement, um, which is the financial downside if you have to actually take it to court in the fight. Is it worth doing it? And if you start calculating, is it worth doing it? You need to ask yourself, well, uh, do I really want to enter into the into that sort of rubbish. And then of course, to actually prepare for these things can take out three months to six months of your life. And if you happen to lose, it can actually knock you out for the rest of your life. So uh, I'm extremely cynical. Uh, I, as I said yesterday, and I don't know that, that uh, the strength of my conviction actually came across. I would rather do a deal with an individual and say, you know what, we're gonna do this agreement. I'm going to watch how you interact. Here's all my resources, everything that you want, everything that traditionally people would sign an agreement to protect all your IP and all that stuff. I'll put it into your hands and I'll watch how you actually work with it. And if you, and all the money can go into your account. And if at the end of the day, you don't share it as we equally intended it at the first divvying up of the deal, I regard that as a stab in my back. And let me tell you, I'm old enough to tell you that, and Ivan might, might point out a few things, stab me in my back once and you're gone. Um, 
we will never do a deal again. So you can take that little short bit of money that you actually got. And I'll, I know that in any, in any particular dealing, and I'm really talking specifically business dealings here, and, and context is what Ed brought up. Uh, there's a different context why agreements are important in different areas, but I'm talking business agreements here. Um, I know in the main, most people who want to take your IP and put it in there, they don't, their teams do not have the same enthusiasm, the same activity levels, the, the same belief, and they don't do justice to it as you and your team would actually do. So what the hell is this all getting down to? The advice that goes out to startup entrepreneurs, go off to your attorney, get your agreements drawn up, protect all your trademarks, protect all rubbish, man. Common law, use common law to protect yourself. Use the technology that we've got. Go out there and establish a, a marker online. Grab yourself a website with your own address. Get common law on your side. And then as things start actually growing and you can see that this thing is going to last, because remember, I, I say to you, less than 99% of all the business operators that get into business actually stay in business over a 10 year period. Um, so it's really these agreements and things, I think, uh, upfront are for people who got tons of money. Uh, uh, they're dealing in the billions and trillions now, and they can throw things out up front to a team of attorney and all the advocates because they know they're actually going to use them. Is it for the startup entrepreneurs, etc.? All about context, okay? So I, I think let me leave it at, at that. Uh, that. That's just for a starter. Great, thanks, Trevor. Right, so Ed, small businesses. Uh, I think it's... Uh, your ballpark, eh? how can how can you help your business fly? Is what Trevor's saying making sense, or do you uh, have, have some uh, counter views? Yeah, I mean, strange enough, Trevor does make some sense. Um, but I think it was um, Trevor said yesterday it's about power, and I was just thinking about some simple contracts. If you think about, I don't know, borrowing some money. Um, if you borrow from a loan shark, the contract's quite simple. You don't repay me, I'll break your legs. Um, it's only when you can't do that that the contract gets more complicated. And I was looking at my credit card agreement just to see you know, what it's like. It's pages and pages and pages long. I don't understand it. Um, and then I thought, well, oh, Amazon uh, Music have got a free offer. Three months free Amazon Music. That sounds great. I'll just have a look. Now, to sign up, I've got to say I've agreed to the terms of use of Amazon and Amazon Music. So I've got to read two terms of um, use. And they are pages and pages and pages and pages long. And then I came across the, this bit that said, these conditions are governed by and construed in, a, construed in accordance with the laws of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. So I've got to read the laws of Luxembourg. And then it says, with the exception of its conflict of law provisions, so I've got to read that, and the, the application of the United Nations um, Convention on Contract International Sales of Goods is expressly excluded. Why have they excluded that? What, what are they trying to pull, a, pull the wool over my eyes? Um, and then they say, we reserve the right to make changes to our um, website policies and terms of conditions of sales at any time. So I've got to keep my eye on them all the time. And then when I started reading the Amazon Music stuff, it said that if I use their auto rip program, which I've got no idea what it was, but it's something to do with CDs and vinyl, then I've got to read the auto rip terms and conditions. Am I gonna do that? No, I'm not. I'm just gonna sign it, aren't I? So I think it's about power. It's about, about conning people, about taking advantage of people. When I, was, when I was a distributor, 
I only used to sell to small individual sports shops because they wanted to buy from me because they needed my stuff to sell to their customers. So they wanted me, I wanted them. We were equal. We were, there were no terms and conditions. The only terms and conditions I ever put in the contract was there to protect myself if they went insolvent because the insolvency laws are quite powerful and I'm quite little. So my little thing just said, I had reservation of title on my goods. So when they went bankrupt and, and the receiver came in, I could walk in their shop and take my stuff away. I never dealt with big shops because big shops suddenly turned around to, oh, by the way, Ed, um, we're not gonna pay you in 30 days. We're gonna pay you in 120 days. Oh, and by the way, Ed, if we don't sell your stuff by the end of the season, you've got to come and take it back because they had the power to dictate the terms of my contract. So I think it is all about power and it is all about, um, I don't know, big corporations get ahead of themselves trying to hide what they're doing because who the hell is going to read through all those terms and conditions from Amazon? Every single person that signs those terms and conditions would have had to read them. So, a million people would have spent all that time reading a load of guff. That's not going to happen, is it? So I think it is all about power and the fact that perhaps they're trying to do something that's not right or not honest. Um, and yeah, Trevor's quite right. Rely on common law. If you're a writer, as soon as you've written whatever you've written, you are protected by law. And the only thing you need to do is prove when you wrote it. In the old days, People used to post their manuscript to them, record delivery, so they've got a signature and a date. Now all you've got to do is just make sure you've kept a copy of what um, time the file was saved on your computer. And as soon as I've written an article, that is actually protected. So yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. I don't really, it's not a subject that floats my boat very much because it kind of annoys me that we've got all this guff Thanks, thanks, Ed. Yeah, look, I think it it is interesting, and in I just posted. A, uh, I think it's a Netflix documentary called "Terms and Conditions." My reply is, is one of the ones that I've seen uh, reasonably recently that uh, that I found quite interesting, and and it comes back to a comment that someone made the other day. You know, Amazon, for example. You know, okay, in some cases you are paying for the product, but in in many cases in social media you're not paying for the product, and if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, um, and. Uh, and I think that's what many of these uh, these terms and conditions uh, documents are actually are actually saying is that once you've accepted their terms and conditions, they effectively own you and your data, and they can do pretty much whatever they want with it. Um, and so, yeah, uh, one has to, one has to think uh, think carefully. But as you say, who 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 reads through terms and conditions when they sign up for a service online? You know, most people just tick the box and say, "Yeah, I accept it," and off they go. And they even do it when they when they uh, opening bank accounts and things like that. I mean, uh, I received a very interesting uh, letter from from my bank uh, during this this lockdown period, saying, you know, please uh, please sign this 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 document that basically absolves the bank of any wrongdoing. Should anything go wrong with my account, um, regardless of whether you know I've communicated via fax or email <laughs> or telephone with them, they, they they take absolutely no responsibility for anything happening on my account. I said, there's absolutely no way that I'm gonna sign that. I mean, you can just, you can just forget it, you know? If, if, if that means if I need something done, I have to physically now go back into a bank with my ID document and, and, and so on to get it done. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm certainly not gonna absolve the bank of any, of any wrongdoing on a transaction on my account because uh, they feel we're doing things remotely and they need to protect themselves. So. If you haven't looked at uh, your recent bank terms and conditions, maybe you should. Uh, so let's go across to the banking man. Jasper, should we absolve the banks of any wrongdoings? Morning. I don't have too much to say be, uh, because I think uh, I share uh, Trevor's uh, sentiment, uh, except that in many cases you do need to uh, tie things down and and you, you don't know what people understand until it's in writing, because we we miscommunicate. Uh, and, and I've seen a lot where uh, we shake hands on this is how we want to proceed with this thing, and then uh, 
after a while, people say, you never said that. I never said that. But at the same time, that in writing doesn't have to be a legal contract with all the French and Latin that no one understand. It could be a simple, um, almost a minutes of meeting, so to speak, or I use a, a MOU a lot. And uh, if we then all agree on the MOU that this is what we understood our roles to be and how we will proceed and the, the way forward, to me, that's as, uh, as binding as I need to, to have it. And uh, I remember when Tre I met Trevor uh, early on in the relationship and, and, and he was as uh, passionate about, uh, you know, here it is, I don't sign contracts and uh, you run with this thing and let's see where, what happens. Uh, I also agree with that sentiment because almost in 90, 90 plus percent of cases, uh, what you intend to do and what then pan out to be, uh, you know, you would have had the wrong legal structure in place anyway, because uh, your business model that you perceived is not viable. Uh, and, you know, a case in point is our community chamber of commerce structure. Uh, so it literally started off as a coffee table discussion open to everybody to attend. Uh, and then um, was only maybe in the second year that we started to try for, uh, certain forms of structure. Uh, and the moment we put structure to it, a lot of animosity happened when people felt, some people felt left out and some people uh, felt they had no further say in the thing. Uh, and I would say it's only uh, in the third year last year, August, that we got to a point where we now have a business model that we now know can work. We've tested it. Uh, and yeah, now one can have basic legal structures that just protect the entity uh, and, and regulate it for VAT and tax and all those kind of things. But uh, yeah, so I agree with that. And then it was an interesting comment of Ed on uh, the pages and pages. And I was just thinking how the we call it the, the, the modern age or the digital age has almost conditioned us not to put value to terms and agree, uh, term, uh, term, terms, and, uh, terms of agreement. Uh, because every little thing that you want to now buy from the internet or uh, access from the internet, uh, and like you say, even free, uh, by law, I have to have that uh, terms of agreement, but subconsciously, or subliminally, you, you're almost conditioned to say, you know, they, they just have to do it for the sake of uh, call it regulation, but uh, it, it's meaningless. Uh, and then it becomes easy for us to just uh, tick the box to say, yes, I agree to terms and conditions. Um, and, it, and I think we would be horrified if we actually read the terms and conditions to see uh, what it is that we just tick off. Uh, so we become a society of uh, speed and uh, we are conditioned to say you know this this kind of thing doesn't have real consequences uh, so don't worry uh, just just take it off because we have to move on with the process and you're keen to, on to move on with the process but then it comes the time that you buy a house or you enter a serious business agreement and then it can bite you in the back so uh, yeah I think uh, I don't like contracts I I avoid them as far as I can, uh, but when you do event, and I'm, I'm guilty when it comes to this online stuff, I just tick the box uh, because my, you know, it's probably subconsciously I'm saying, okay, uh, if, if something need to come out of it, how are you gonna get your software back? And uh, how are you gonna uh, catch me? So I'm, I'm looking at my downside to say, uh, if I tick this box, what's the worst that can happen to me? And if I can live with that, uh, that's probably why, how I, Go through the go through the process. Um, yeah, so I think that's my contribution that we are conditioned, and the legal one is just one of the ways that we condition. But if we are conditioned on something as serious as a legal contract that has uh, a, 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 what do you call it overflow into even Dutch law and world authority law and all sorts of things, and we just tick the box. Uh, imagine how easy we are being manipulated and conditioned uh, through media on a daily basis um, and through politicians on a daily basis. So, uh, so I think my, my point there is just the, the power of conditioning.
Great, thanks, Jasper. And how do you know what uh, the worst is going to happen to you if you just tick the box and don't read the terms and conditions? <laughs> you never will. But uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, uh, we are conditioned, and, and I think society conditions us in so many different ways. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting how we just accept certain things that perhaps we shouldn't. So, Donovan, uh, let's, let's hear your thoughts. Thanks, Ivan. Morning, everyone. Yeah, it's one of those things you can't escape it. But if Esther says if you can escape it by you know not getting into the legality legalities, and then should a partner or party misbehave, then you can just you know not deal with them in future. But uh, it's uh, in terms of how society operates. Um, these days, you, you can't escape it, you know. Almost everything you do online, you have to agree or accept to the terms and conditions which you don't read. You, know, you just assume there won't be a need one day for you to rely on it. And it's like you, you put on um, blinders, you just hope you'll, you'll reach your destination, which is not always, you know, a good thing to do, but we are forced to. So it ends up uh, putting us into a very unjust world or unjust system where only the rich or those who uh, can afford it, you know, they, they are the ones in control. We are just minions, if I can use the term. Uh, we are just, you know, slaves to the system. Uh, someone once said, there's no justice in the world, it is just us. And that's where I'm leaving it. Thank you. Thanks, Donovan. Yeah, I've, I've heard that one. Um, yeah, I think it's it's true. Eh? So, Nazipo, you unfortunately didn't uh, manage to stick around with your connection problems yesterday, but I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on contracts and how they've impacted you or otherwise in your business. Great. Thanks, Ivan. I think, you know, as the conversation is going on, I'm just thinking, for example, the platform we're on now, on Zoom, um, we're on this platform, and in here, and it's for us to get there, we would have had to sign a contract of, you know, what it entails to get the Zoom that we are on. But I assure you, I don't know anything about what it says, because I practiced in a different Zoom, when I needed to and I was not going to go through that entire contract. So that's the, 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 the difficulty though with, um, especially the online stuff. I think I, I realize as you go through the conversation that this is what it has taken us. This is where the online um, migration has brought about. But prior to the online migration, I had been burned prior by the not um, putting contracts into place putting proper contracts into place and making sure that everything is proper. So after I got burned, because I never used to pay that much attention to contracts either, but after I got burned, then I, then after then I knew I had to reconnect. So it's been much easier on the, the previous world, but in this world, the online world, I now tend to overlook some, some of those things. You know, Franklin Covey has got a book which is called um, The Speed of Trust. And it talks about how much quicker business and things would work if we only operated on, the, on, on trusting each other. Because, you know, it, the contracts also become part of the red tapes that you, you get to go across even in business. And whilst the, you, you know, I would love to operate on a speed of trust. And for me personally, whether, not just personally, but in business as well, I don't like the process of having to then follow up and force people to use their conscience or their, like, I feel if we can't be just with one another, it's not even worth it. And yet I know that it's, it's expensive to not have that contract in place, not just um, financially, but emotionally as well when things go south, it just becomes a whole big mountain that you gotta go through. So yeah, that's where I am. I, I wish we didn't have to go through them, but you know, we deal with humans and they must be there. Thanks. 
All right, thanks, thanks, Nazipa. Yeah, we deal with humans. That's uh, that's a sad fact. I mean, we deal with animals. Maybe you'd know where you stood. Uh, eaten or get eat or be eaten. Yeah, I don't. Know. <laughs> right. So, Trevor Carty, you started this whole discussion yesterday. So, I think it's over to you to wrap it up uh, today. Il conto par favore. Um, Ed, won't you just translate that quickly, please? All right. What, what, it, what it says is when you're in Italy and you put your hand up after the meal, you say, il conto par favore. And it means, can I have the bill, please? And it's the end of your contract. You have enjoyed their infrastructure, their hospitality, their wine, their food, the what, 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 what. And now it's come down to the money. It's all about the money. So let's just stop here just for a little moment and think about the money. Let's assume that this motley crew of ours have got a beautiful uh, platform and some content and we, we managed to sign up one, two, three, five, ten million one million one dollar a month users. And at 10 million users, we now have $120 million a year business which we decide we're going to list. Now, let me tell you two things. If you haven't got it right in the beginning, good freaking luck. Things don't go wrong. Things start wrong. And here's the thing. Trevor Nell's going to die first, okay? And now his estate's going to come in and say, um, but hold on, 20X said, and we don't care what 20X says. Where is the contract that says 20X has anything? Because why? The living don't argue with the dead. And the dead can't argue. So the first thing you need to know is my name is Trevor Carty. My initials are TC and my friends call me TC. Why? It's terms and conditions. I have four children. I gave them an extra leg to this whole thing. They are TC Carty. Terms and conditions Carty, because I learned before I had the extra C how you get screwed if you don't get the foundation of whatever you're doing right. So Tristano, Tamika, Talula, and Teo, you now know why you are TC Carty. I'm going to send you this recording from the great um, Top Cat. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, <laughs> And I want to just tell you a story of trust quickly. Um, you know, I, I went down to Zanin two Fridays ago. And after the morning's meeting, we found ourselves in a gin distillery enjoying spectacular gin. And I looked at these guys and I said, yes, you really could do some stuff here. And the guy said, yeah, but we don't know who to do stuff with. I said, well, how about we have a bit of a dip for you? So they said, no, cool. That's fantastic. Um, I said, what does that mean? He says, oh, I'll give you a couple of boxes. You can check out how it goes and you can apply your mind and your network. And uh, I thought, that's fantastic. And the first week back, hey, I don't think I've ever drunk so much gin and tonic. So here's the thing, gin and tonic. All right. You don't drink gin neat unless you're a proper alcoholic. Okay. The Germans put it in the freezer and they drink it neat as a grappa. But the rest of the world, gin and orange juice, gin and tonic, but traditionally gin and tonic. Your part of the woods, Edward, gin and tonic, yeah? Standard, traditional gin and tonic. Okay, so I come out of my prayer session this morning. It's now two weeks since I was in, <laughs> in Zanin. And this morning, I traditionally make coffee for the 40 men in our father's group. And my early morning coffee pourer said to me, when are you ever bringing those gins you spoke about last week? I said, you know what? You're dead right. So I went and I got my traveling sample box of six out of the car. I laid them up. And by the time the third guy arrived, he did, really didn't want a coffee. But at half past five, it's maybe a bit early for a gin and tonic. No problem. We go and do our prayer thing, finish up. I get in the car. Five past seven. I've got a ping from one of my best mates. His business is called Global Liquor Merchants. He says, man. Miss South Africa is looking for a pouring gin range. Would you partner with them? So I said, I'm sure I would. 
And there I didn't read his message because that's just me. I don't read terms and conditions. I know you guys all have a cell phone and you've all read your terms and conditions of your cell phone and the data you're on today. So I know you guys are perfect. And that's why if you can do it, I'll do it. But that's not really why. It's because of the listing, because of the shareholders. They want to know who's accountable, who's reportable, and how much money have we got. It's all about the money. And so what happens is here's this guy's name and number. And it's the funniest thing. His name is Louis Westhazen, Clark and Kent. Okay, now I don't know. That's the strangest surname I've ever heard. So I sent this like a voicemail. I say, listen, we would love to be your pouring range partners. Um, give me a call back. Yeah, I'm in my car. I'm going down Grosvenor Road. I'm going to go give my mother a quick kiss, see if she's still alive, 79 years old, before I get back for Wisdoms. Oh, and guess what? As I'm driving in, my phone rings. And hey, I'm Louis Oersthausen. I said, what's the rest of your surname? He says, no, that's my brand of tonic. I said, a bigger pardon? He says, yes, we are Clark and Kent Tonic Worldwide. I said, now, isn't that interesting? He says, so you're going to be my partner in this thing at Casalinga on the 13th of November. Yeah, I drive into my complex now, and there's a big sign up saying, tomorrow at the pool, 11 to 3. Bring whatever you want to sell. And I take the picture, and I send it to this guy. I say, what do you say we sell gin and tonic tomorrow at the pool? And he says to me, fantastic. How many people... I said, well, I'm going to put out six bottles of tonic. There are 450 people here. I don't know how many people will drink it. He says, okay, I'll work out enough tonic for the six bottles. He says, and I will drop them off with you today. Now, here's something that's happened in the last hour. No contracts, no nothing, and it will be beautiful. But here's where it goes pear-shaped. He says, and when I drop off your free opening stock, I will send you my contract for our terms and conditions with future business. So, you're right. I started it. Um, but I didn't start it. This thing was started way back, way back, and way back when we realized we are actually just liars and cheats. And if we weren't liars and cheats, and we were trustworthy individuals who didn't have greed as one of our basic principles, then we could get some stuff done. But regrettably, the listing requires a prospectus. And the prospectus Needs to be how many pages on average, Trevor Nell, who's listed how many businesses, how many pages in your prospectus? Yes, I see a nod. Okay. They, I've counted 40, 60, 80. There you go. So, guys, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm loving the fact that Jasper has written a book. I phoned him three minutes before this conversation. I said, Jasper, I got a last minute invite to have lunch with the Minister of Education. I need a book and I need you, please to write to this minister and tell him things will not change minister unless you change and we need to change minister so guys i wish you a fair fair to brilliant weekend i ask your prayer over today's meeting with the minister of education trevor Nell, Ivan anderson and i hope Lee, you watching this please believe me today Wisdoms is coming into the space of the education system in South Africa. And here's the deal. I don't have to control the universe, but I have to control the contract. So have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, guys. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Trevor. I think a, a great uh, a great summary uh, and wrapping up of the situation. And uh, yeah, all the best with that meeting. It sounds interesting. And uh, just don't fall into the swimming pool after too many gins and tonics before you get this <laughs> or after you've been there. Uh, because then what happens? You know, <laughs> you know, who's got the contract then when you just had the discussion and you've disappeared down the plug hole? So yeah, I don't... Uh, I, th I think it's been it's been really interesting and uh, and yeah, lots of different uh, perspectives and yeah, there definitely are cases when they need it and uh, definitely cases when uh, they're dangerous. So I think one has to think about it really carefully uh, when you go into these things. And uh, unfortunately, as for the one thing I do disagree with you, I think people can misinterpret the written word just as well as they mis misinterpret the spoken word. So uh, I'm not convinced that putting it down in writing necessarily makes a whole lot of difference in terms of interpretation and understanding, but. Uh, if you can keep it simple, one, two, three, you might be able to make it happen. So, uh, Trevor, Nell, that is, uh, I think uh, that, that's us for this morning on contracts. Have you any thoughts what we might be doing on Monday morning? I do, actually. Um, I don't know if we've touched on this before, but I think I, uh, because I, oh, we're not into November. Uh, so 2021 is, a, uh, is upon us. 
and I'm having a look at things that are happening here in South Africa. Uh, and I'm talking about COVID worldwide and having a look at the presidential elections in the US. Uh, no one knows what the hell is going on in any of these events and what the end result is going to be. Um, so I think we've been talking somewhere, I've been talking on so many different platforms um, about having alternatives. And I'd love to hear what people are thinking of as their what ifs. Now, the, the one thing I loved about the advent of technology to me was when this Lotus 1, 2, 3 and then spreadsheets and all that actually came, uh, came to us. And we were into what if analysis, uh, not on paper, but it was everyone was talking what if analysis 30, 40 odd years ago. But this is time to be in serious what if um, this world goes down the path of Trump or the path of Biden. Uh, the path of COVID is yet to stay for the next three to five years without a vaccine, uh, or it is not a problem beginning January. Uh, what decisions are you going to take? Because dependent on those different paths are going to be different things. Uh, Dawn sent me uh, a copy of an eminent group in, the, in Europe uh, who had a discussion about the future of the exhibitions industry. Here they're talking of they don't think it's going to recover for the next three to five years. Um, you sit and listen. I, I listened to Davi Root of Efficient Group. I'd love to get him on board who turns around and says, well, uh, the end of the world is nigh in South Africa. And then um, Jasper, uh, Jasper, you're going to have to remind me of the boy who came on the talk of so many people. He was phenomenal. And that's why I want to- Rulof Rulof Wurta. Thank you very much. Who was the complete opposite. Um, and, and I'm a contrarian. So I love to actually listen to what the crowd is saying, because then I'm looking for, okay, how do I go against the crowd? Uh, because that's where I think the money is. And this guy had a completely contrarian view to everything else that I see uh, on TV. And I, and I look at Tito Mbuweni turning around and saying, oh, well, we'll give another 10 and a half billion to SAA. And by the way, our debt to GDP ratio is going to hit 95%. If we were to do that in our own homes, we'd be in the, there was a lovely three letter word somewhere up there um, in the cock, man. Um, so, you know, what if, what are your what if scenarios going forward into 2021? I've got them. I, I'm working flat out on them. This is one of them. Uh, and how to expand this and get this what if bigger and bigger. So I, I, would that be an interesting conversation? Great. Yeah, good. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, uh, everyone else. Uh, so uh, what if you have a fantastic weekend and you don't put any thought into this at all? Or what if you have a fantastic weekend and you put lots of thought into this? So uh, I think that's the way we've got to go. So have a great one, folks. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on Monday morning again. Oh, well, cheers.